Hi, I'm Bob Tabor with www.learnvisualstudio.net. In this module, we're going to talk about the common ways that you'll wind up working with Microsoft Azure. It's touch points, I guess you can say. And so the most common way is to use the Microsoft Azure Management Portal, which I'm going to cover in more depth in one of the upcoming modules. Uh, actually, there are two portals right now as I record this lesson. Uh, the current Azure Management Portal will at some point give way to the new preview portal. In fact, at this moment, the preview portal refers to its older sister as the full portal because there are more things that you can do with it today. So why the need for a new portal? Why the need for this preview portal? Well, there are two major things that the preview portal is attempting to address. First of all, the preview portal is oriented around projects all of the various services that are used for a single project are, are kind of grouped together in what's called a resource group. In the current portal, you see all of these things just kind of mixed together, and it's hard to find what you're looking for. Uh, so if you have 50 virtual machines up and running, let's say, for example, there's no easy way to discern which of those virtual machines belong to which project that you're working on. So it'll be uh, easier at some point to see all of the components that comprise a system collected together in a grouping called a resource group. Secondly, the preview portal will be highly customizable and it will allow you to pin certain pieces of information to your home screen or as the development team calls it, the, the start board and those things should be pertinent to your role in the organization or your role within a given project. So different employees can pin different information about the projects that they're involved in, the things that they're interested in. So we'll, again, talk about this more in an upcoming module. Besides the management portal, there are several other ways to work with Microsoft Azure. Administrators might prefer to use Azure PowerShell commandlets uh, to create scripts and to automate certain common tasks like maintenance, uh, standing up a new virtual machine or a service that should be configured in a particular way, or redeploying project updates to all the services that are involved in an application all in one fell swoop in a consistent and regimented manner. Uh, and, and for developers, Visual Studio's Server Explorer has built-in tools to provision and deploy code to Microsoft Azure services. So you can spin up new services, even virtual machines right from within Visual Studio. And there are other wizards that will help you deploy, uh, for example, web applications up to uh, a given uh, service like uh, Microsoft Azure websites. Uh, developers and database administrators that utilize SQL Azure might use SQL Server Management Studio just like they do right now to administer uh, on-premise uh, instances of SQL Server. And then there are other tools that you can use to deploy uh, websites to Azure like WebMatrix, you can use FTP clients, uh, and so on. And we'll talk about these later in this series. But in addition to the standard means of working with Microsoft Azure, there's also a rich programming model for managing your services. We already discussed the PowerShell commandlets and how you can script the creation or the management of services. That's great if you know PowerShell. I am not a PowerShell expert. I need to be a PowerShell expert someday. So fortunately, there's a service management API that I can program against. Uh, as a .NET developer. There's also a version of this for Java developers and for Node.js developers, and I believe there's some more coming soon for like PHP, for example. Uh, if you take a look on screen right now, you can see this diagram that both PowerShell commandlets and Visual Studio's own tooling, they both rely on the .NET version of the Service Management API the same API that you can program against, allowing you to perform virtually any operation in code or script uh, that you can perform inside of the management portal. And if you peel back that service management API, uh, the .NET version, the Java version, the Node.js version, whatever, you come to realize that all of these are simply a wrapper uh, around a common set of RESTful HTTP-based 
web service API. So in other words, you could bypass the service management API altogether if you wanted to. Maybe you want to write a tool in PHP or Perl or Ruby. As long as it can hit a plain old vanilla RESTful HTTP based web service API, you can do anything you want to manage your Azure services. I've seen in one case where you want to restrict who can do what inside of uh, Azure and so they created a custom portal using these a RESTful HTTP uh, APIs to do that. So the ability to automate common tasks and make Azure more powerful and predictable is, uh, is an extremely valuable asset whenever you decide that you're going to work with Microsoft Azure. And you might think that, hey, I'm never going to need this. I'm never going to need the Azure Service Management APIs. I mean, you know, I never felt compelled to use SQL management objects to automate SQL Server deployments. I've never felt compelled to automate something in Visual Studio using VS packages. Sure, I knew I could do it, but I never felt like I really needed to. However, when working with Microsoft Azure, it's a little bit different. Scripting everything, automating everything is a best practice. As developers and administrators get into the habit of scripting every action, uh, that we need to perform, we're going to need to make upfront investments in automating uh, our deployments, automating our teardowns, and then treating those scripts that we've created in that code the way that you would treat any other script or code, uh, source code inside of any given project. Uh, you would treat it, you know, putting it in source control, you document it, and things of that nature. And this isn't something that I came up with. This is actually the first of 12 best practices that were outlined by Scott Guthrie in a seminal tech ed session that he gave in 2013 about patterns and practices. And you can see the URL on screen to watch that. Uh, it was so important that members of the Azure team actually turned that talk into a free ebook, which you can download here. And this is just one of a handful of what I would consider required reading or required watching. Uh, and I'm going to re recommend that you watch that near the end of the series. So as we wrap up this module, one of the main takeaways is that the Azure Management Portal is great for learning uh, and great for the occasional one-off operation. But once you commit to Azure, you need to commit to automation as well. It's going to save you time. It's going to reduce the mistakes uh, that you make as you repeatedly deploy your applications or your code to Azure as a developer or as you deploy, maintain, or tear down virtual machines uh, and services within Azure as a network or system administrator. So to recap what we talked about in this module, we talked about the various ways that you can interact with Azure. The old and new portals, uh, integrating with existing client development tools like Visual Studio and SQL Server Management Studio and so on. And also we talked about scripted and automated management through either PowerShell commandlets, uh, through a service management API that's friendly to .NET, or through a set of RESTful HTTP web services that's available pretty much to any programming language that can call a RESTful HTTP web service. So those are the touch points, the ways that you will wind up contacting or working with Microsoft Azure. Thank you.